Children's Church, Kids Church, you are dismissed with Catalina, so please head out. Thank you, Veronica. How's everybody doing tonight? Just go ahead and extend your hands to these exiting children. Father, we just thank you so much for these children. Father, we bless them, Father God, and we just decree and declare right now that their ears are prepared to be able to hear what you're going to release to them. If you believe it, say amen. 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 Well, you know, it's been a minute since I've been with you guys. You guys look good. You guys look like you're smiling. Nobody's missing limbs or fingers or toes, not that I can tell. And so I'm just extremely happy to be able to be with you guys again. How many of you enjoyed worship tonight? Oh my goodness. Pastor Carl, I'm just so appreciative that you're able to join us all the way from Phoenix to make it over here to lead us in worship. Wasn't that just amazing? It was just such a blessing to be able to do that. Well, you guys, I just got back from a trip to New Orleans. Anybody ever been to New Orleans before? Okay, yeah, it's it's a it's a fun time, let me tell you, okay? And this was my first time going to New Orleans. Uh, my friend who just took over the Bourbon Street House of Prayer, they actually have a house of prayer right on Bourbon Street, and they actually meet at a bar called Saints and Sinners. How cool is that, right? A cool bar named Saints and Sinners, you know? I know I know, 21-year-old me would have loved to go to Saints and Sinners for other reasons, but uh, this past weekend, I went there for a church meeting. We got a chance to be able to minister uh, to a bunch of people right there on Bourbon Street. Isn't that incredible? It's incredible. One of the most amazing things about this is that it is notorious. Bourbon Street, New Orleans, is notorious for its witchcraft, its darkness, its voodoo, all of those different things. In fact, uh, there are many ministers and pastors that spend time in New Orleans only to go back to their home churches to tell the boogeyman stories that they've encountered in their time in New Orleans. But can I tell you that there is, there is something that is happening in that place, in that territory, where in spite of the darkness and the things that are going on there, God is on the move, even in the darkest of situations. Amen? I was right there with my friend Garrett, who has taken over the ministry there, uh, and he was giving me a tour of not only Bourbon Street, but Jackson Square and, and the French Quarter and all of those different places, uh, and, and we were just identifying and looking at the places of darkness. And can I tell you this, is that I am not a person who likes hunting for the devil behind every single corner. I understand that the enemy exists, but how many of you know that a lot of the power the enemy has is the position and the authority that we give him because we give him more credit than he deserves. And so it was so interesting because when we were walking through New Orleans and, and going to all of those different places, we, we stopped by this place called the Vampire Cafe. Oh, what a name. I mean, that's some killer branding right there. The, the Vampire uh, Cafe is a bar in the French Quarter where people literally go to drink the blood of other human beings. Oh, Isn't that interesting? Yeah, so this is what they have. Uh, any Twilight fans we got out in here? Okay, that was a test. Okay, so nobody in here. Um, but basically what we have is we have modern day people who consider themselves vampires. And so there's a lot of them in New Orleans where they actually surgically, dentally enhance the teeth in their mouth to resemble fangs. And then we have people in the community that actually want to be fed on by a vampire. And so they get together at the vampire cafe and they sit there and the people who want to be fed on give them their wrists, their arms, or their neck, or whatever portion, and these modern day vampires feast on the blood of human beings. Everybody go, ooh, scary, right? And it's this whole different thing, but how many of you know that for a lot of people, that's a little bit intimidating? It's a little bit off-putting, like, wait a second, are you gonna drink my blood? Like, how's, how, what's going on, right? And then in Jackson Square, which is right there, there's like a, a Catholic church and all of these different things there, all along the sidewalk, as far as you can see, are dozens and dozens of fortune tellers, psychics, witches, and warlocks. And for just a few dollars, you can sit down and you can get a fortune from one of these psychics and one of these warlocks. Is that interesting? And can I tell you that one of the craziest situations is that the response of the churches in that area predominantly has been to take signs and to go out into those areas of darkness 
and shout at these people and tell them that they're going to hell. Now listen, we all know they're going to hell if they don't make some changes, right? You can't drink blood of human beings and expect to go to heaven, right? right. But the response has been something that was about calling out their, uh, condemning them, calling out their sin, calling out all of these different things without a desire to reach out to them in the midst of their pain and to say, listen, I understand that what is going on right now, what you're involved in right now is not necessarily because you want to be there. But there is a brokenness on the inside of you that I want you to know as a believer, I care about. I want to be able to be that instrument that God is in your life to be able to bring healing and transformation in that area of your life. And so uh, here's the amazing thing is that there's a generation of people that are raised up in, the, in New Orleans right now. that are going out to the witchcraft community, going out over to the homeless communities, and they're beginning to release the love of the Lord over these people. And people are getting changed and transformed. It's an amazing thing that's happening. And you know what's a, what's a, 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 there was this testimony of this woman, this, you'd love this woman. She goes every six weeks to the French Quarter to minister to the homeless. And people have told her that she's wasting her time, that, you know, those people can't be helped. They're all on drugs, and that's the reason why they're homeless, and, and they don't even want to get clean, and all of these different things. All of the stuff that we hear uh, about the homeless. And yet she said, there's something in me, the mother's heart that God has placed on the inside of me that refuses to let somebody's child live on the street without knowing that Jesus loves them. And could you imagine for three straight years, this woman gets in her car all the way from Kentucky, drives 10, 12 hours down to New Orleans, takes a backpack as a woman, as a, takes a backpack in one of the most dangerous areas in America and goes and loves on the homeless. And you know what's interesting is that this woman that said that people are saying is making a mistake, is wasting her resources and all of those different things. Just a few weeks ago, she got a phone call from someone that she ministers to on the street. And she and this gentleman says, Mama, I want you to know I've hit rock bottom. I have no other options and I want to end my life. Please, what is God saying to me? It is one of the most incredible things that I've heard in the last year is that a person who has hit rock bottom would not call his own family. A person who has hit absolutely every tree branch on the way down did not call a friend, but he reached out to someone that had the word of the Lord in her mouth. Yeah. Reach out to someone that not only had the word of the Lord in her mouth, but had the love, the compassion, and the empathy to be able to reach out and say, this is what God is saying, and I'm here to fight with you. I'm here to fight along with you. And so here's the interesting thing is that this season that we're in right now is a season where God is showing up in unprecedented ways and he's partnering with us in crazy ways that are going to begin to blow the minds of people now why am i sharing this thing about my trip or my vacation to new orleans right the reason why i'm sharing this is because god is getting ready to equip us to enter and intervene in the messes of other people's lives for too long, we have been in a society that has been fascinated with making things appear to be better than they are, to beautify things that underneath the surface are ugly. We are more satisfied and content to be able to have people play the part of a healthy Christian than being willing to engage with the mess that's on the inside of people's lives that they're dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis. But God is looking in the midst of this season right now, and he's saying, who is willing to to engage in the mess of people, to be willing to allow the residue to come close to them so that people's lives can be transformed. And I'm saying right now that God is releasing a call. He's releasing an impartation inside of this church in this last season where he's saying there is a generation here that is going to answer that call. Amen. Amen. But what does it take to answer that call? What is it? What is required of us in the midst of our process and what God has called us to do in order to be the one that says, I am the answer that says I am the one that God is going to use to intervene in the narrative of darkness that is in people's lives and give them a prophetic word and hope 
for a future? What does it take? What is required for me to be able to do this? And I want to encourage you. What we're talking about tonight is that God wants to anoint you to be a deliverer. I want you to look at your partner next to you, and I want you to say, God has anointed you to be a deliverer. All right, all right. Some of you are super humble. You're just like, oh, no, not me. Oh, stop it. No, tell me more. Tell me more, right? But God has anointed you to be a deliverer. Now, one of the greatest examples that we have of this is Moses in the Bible. How many of you know the story of Moses, right? Now, now I grew up, I grew up watching TV Land and Turner Classic Movies. Anybody love those classic movies? So my vision and picture of Moses is Charleston Heston in a bathroom, okay? With some really good facial hair, solid cheekbone structure, and just, he's just epic, right? So that's my experience with Moses in the Bible. So whenever I go to Sunday school and talk about Moses, I have this picture and this vision of Charleston Heston, right? The pinnacle of masculinity in, the, in that generation. It was incredible. But can I tell you that when you read the story of Moses in the Bible, he is very different than the picture that is portrayed yes. on film. Yes. Moses is one that is always, nearly always intimidated by the circumstances around him. That is always hesitant, where other people are driving in to take action. Other people are engaging. Moses hangs back, waiting to see if there's anybody else that will answer the call. And this is the first level of encouragement that I want to give you, is that when God calls you to be a deliverer, you don't have to have the qualities that people indicate would be inherent inside of the deliverer. You don't have to have the goods in you now for God to anoint you to be one that, that begins to go into the darkness and set people free. In fact, the more qualified you are, the more disqualified you are for God to be able to use you in an effective way. Because can I tell you something? There is nothing harder to work with than a talented individual. I know that people want to tell you the opposite. I know that people want to say, oh, if only I had someone that was tech savvy in my media team that knew how to work a cell phone, I would become the next Benny Hinn. Can I tell you that the more talented a person is, the more difficult it is for God to use them. You want to, you want to know why? Because there is a lot more distance between that person and rock bottom than someone that starts out coming out of the womb saying, I got nothing to offer, but God used me. I can tell you this because I like to fancy myself as a talented person. I'm Asian, I'm Chinese, we all think we're talented, okay, we're good at math, we have medical futures, all of those different things, right? We can do anything. I could be in oncology right now if I wanted to. And, and so I, I fancy myself as a talented person. I think all of this, these different things, but can I tell you that one of the hardest, most difficult things that I have had to undergo in my life was me to get to the end of myself in what I viewed as a positive strength or gift, because here's the thing, is that oftentimes when you have skills and talents inherent inside of you, you think that you have those things apart and separate from the grace of God that created you to put it there in the first place. And we might cover it with humility. We might cover it with things that look pretty, oh, bless God, you know, I'm just blessed to be a blessing. But deep down, we think we're hot stuff. But every single process of becoming a deliverer is dependent on your ability to hit rock bottom and realize that apart from God, you have absolutely nothing to offer the community around you. You have nothing to offer those that you have been called to. You have nothing to offer. And that might sound like an insult, but it's actually one of the most liberating revelations you could possibly have. Because here's the thing, is that we must act like the world depends on us. But we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit working through us, saying that apart from the power of God, there's no way that any of this can happen. We have to move with an urgency like it relies on us, but we have to move with a faith that says that I need to believe that God can use me as long as I am yielded to him. And Moses had to get there. Now here's the thing, is that Moses had a lot of things going for him, and we know this. He's uh, grafted into a royal family. He is a part of, of the of a leading ruling class of one of the most powerful empires and dynasties in all of human history, the Egyptian Empire. Moses is raised to 
be a ruler. And in fact, his name, we know, means deliverer. But when you look deeper inside of the name of Moses, you see that there's a prophetic purpose to who he is. You see, Moses is, it doesn't just mean deliverer. It means he brings them out. So you see, Moses is named and has an expectation put on him that he is meant to bring people out of bondage. Boo, could you imagine? That's like you coming out of the womb and being like, and like looking at, you know, like Robert Jr. I mean, he's got all of the, the physical specifications to be a mighty man of valor, right? But it's like Robert Jr. coming out of the womb and the doctor just saying, this is the one that is going to set all of the things that are wrong with the city of Tucson straight. And instead of calling, and instead of you going to grade school and them calling you Robert Jr., they're calling you he who will set the wrong things in Tucson right. Right? Now, that's really good. Right? I felt the anointing on that, so there might be something to that. You should probably submit that to your pastoral authority to see what that, that, that talks about. You should probably discuss that. But here's the thing. is Could you imagine being a child and having the weight of that expectation thrust upon you? You see, Moses isn't the way he is on purpose. Moses is the way he is because of a dysfunctional society that has put something on him without introducing him to a God that can make it happen through him. And so Moses begins a journey in his life where he seeks every single physical way he can in order to fulfill the name that he has been given to bring people out of bondage. Right now, I wanna, I wanna set some of us free in here because we live in a very strong, culturally strong society. Like uh, in the Asian culture, and I know in a lot of Latin American culture, family is a very strong nucleus in which we operate and all life centers around. You see, you are defined, and oftentimes you are identified, not necessarily by who you are, but who your family is. You see, oh, you're so-and-so's child. Oh, you're so-and-so's cousin. You're related to so-and-so. Much in the Latin American country, similar to the Asian culture, uh, the culture is that you are associated and identified by the people in your circle more than even who you are. And that's a beautiful thing for family. That's a beautiful thing for community and all of those different things, but it has some landmines and some difficulties involved. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Right. Because see, if you're part of this family, there are certain expectations that are put on you. There are certain modes and ways of behavior that you're expected to be able to adhere to. And oftentimes, we go throughout our life living under the weight of an expectation that we were never meant to live under. All of a sudden, the things that you're doing in your life, the career path, the school choices, the, the jobs, the relationships that you're in, and you take a step back, all of a sudden, it might shock you to believe that this is not a product of your own choice and decisions and necessarily what God has called you to, but it is an outward expression of your desire to meet the expectations of everyone around you that says they love you, but in reality, they have an expectation of who you are that was never meant to be there in the first place. Moses, we understand in the story, kills an Egyptian slave master. Now, it seems like a very random thing to happen. Like, hey, Moses woke up one morning, decided to kill a slave driver, right? But not really. When you understand the context and the pressure that Moses is in. Moses, he wakes up every morning to the fact that his name means deliver. His name means to set people free. And every single day he can hear the crying, the shouting, and the screaming of a people, his people, that are living under the rule of a tyrannical government that is forcing them to make things and to do things that they were never meant to be able to do. He is living constantly, every single day, facing what he sees as a failure on his part. 
Could you imagine every single day waking up and being confronted by your failure? Where in the back of your mind, you're saying, the reason why this is this way is because of my fault, because I'm not better, because I don't have the strength, because I don't have the courage. I need to do something about this. Come on, Moses, come on. Why won't you do something in the face of this tyranny? Look, that could be your mother, and she's being beaten by a slave driver. Why won't you do something? And we understand that what seems crazy in the moment doesn't seem so crazy. Because Moses is living under the weight of expectation, not of how God would fulfill his prophetic destiny, but the weight of expectation of a culture and of his name. I wanna let you know that one of the first steps of becoming a deliverer in this season is that we have to divorce ourselves from the expectation of family and those that they claim to know us better than even the Holy Spirit knows us. I understand that it's difficult. I understand that it's not a popular message, but until we are willing to divorce ourselves from the expectation of man, even from those that bore us and gave birth to us, we will never truly step into our power. You know why? Because there can only be one God in our life. There can only be one ruler in our life. There can only be one influencer in our life. And even though God may bring people into our life to influence and guide and mentor us, at the end of the day, there is only one person that can sit on that throne. Amen. Moses gets in bad trouble. He gets banished to the dark side of the desert. Could you imagine that? He tries to fulfill it in his own mind. To deliver at least just one slave. If I could just set one slave free, that would help ease the frustration that I feel on the inside of me. Can I tell you that most people, the reason why they fail in being a deliverer over a city and a territory is because they are willing to settle for anything that is a lesser degree of what God wants to do for them because they are motivated by the frustration inside of them rather than the hunger and the desire of God around them. And so here's the thing is that Moses goes into exile for all of these years. And I want to forward, fast forward to this one moment. Of course, we know the burning bush and all those different things. But I want to highlight this one area in the process of becoming a deliverer. Moses. Man, such a character. He's back in Egypt, back in the, back in the neighborhood, you guys. Moses is back out there, you know. Everybody's like, oh my gosh, did you see Moses back in town? Love it. Love it. Stuff is going to get crazy. <laughs> and Moses has the power of God with him. Moses has the prophetic word upon him, but Moses feels completely unworthy of his call to life. Now, what I want to encourage you is that when you hit rock bottom, where God humbles you and brings you to the end of yourself, do not take out a tent. Do not set up camp. Do not think, hey, you know what? The views are nice here. I'm going to build a home here. When you hit rock bottom, keep going. Do not stop because it is simply a waypoint where God teaches you a lesson, but then he's going to rebuild you up in the form and fashion that he has always intended for you to be. Moses stands there and he brings the 10 plagues. How many of you remember the story of the plagues, right? My goodness, have you, has any of you like stayed up nights and wondered like what it would be like to have lived under those 10 plagues? <laughs> like there was a time a couple years ago where there were killer wasps on the loose. Did you hear that? It was like pen the pandemic came and then all of a sudden killer wasps were a thing, right? And I was like, that's it. That's just like Moses. That's it, you know? And here's the interesting thing though is that God spends all of this time, all of this effort to hype Moses up. Moses, you're going to be a deliverer. You're going to take the children out of, the, out of Egypt. You're going to bring them to the promised land. I'm going to be with you. I'm also going to send Aaron with you. You're going to be so good. You're going to be rock solid awesome. Your future is ahead of you. He gets the most amazing prophetic word, not from a prophet, but from God himself. And then he goes there and he does these plays. He, he brings these things in and then here's what happens. Exodus chapter 9, verse 12. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he would not listen to Moses and Aaron. Boo. And so this is the part that I want to I want to hit on tonight. Is that the path to becoming a deliverer 
comes through a journey and a road that is filled with rejection. I think you guys are about, about ready to walk out. I know, you're like, come on. But I want to encourage you right now is that Moses, coming off of the most powerful encounters with God, where he is set on an assignment to be able to deliver a nation, is faced with rejection after rejection after rejection. Why is the path to setting people free so difficult and so hard? Why is it that if I'm doing all y'all a favor, I'm the one that's getting rejected? Why is it that I'm the one that is going to all of these churches to be able to bring a word to the, uh, from the Lord to them, to be able to bless them, to be able to set a generational blessing where there was a generational iniquity, and they're walking out of the service? I'm doing y'all a favor. Not y'all, because y'all are family, right? <laughs> I'm doing y'all a favor. I came all this way. You're going to reject me? Oh, yeah, how many of you know you get up in your feelings, right? How many of you have ever been in that situation or season in your life where you felt like you were on a journey to fulfilling what God had called you to do, to reach out to that soul, to reach out to that person, and you thought they were going to be grateful? And the opposite happened. They're like, I didn't even ask for your help, man. What are you talking about? Why are you in my life? Why are you in my business? You know, it makes you want to give them some five-fold ministry. You know, I'm just like, come on. You know, just do a little bit of that stuff. Amen. Amen. So there we go. We, we got some real ones in the house. And here's the interesting thing, is that we ask the question, why? God, if I'm doing what you've called me to do, why is it so difficult to do it sometimes? Why is it that the doors are closing all around me and I'm constantly being frustrated by all of these things that are not turning out the way that they're supposed to? God, it feels like I'm fighting against you rather than fighting with you. What is going on? And God wanted me to tell you tonight, God wanted me to, to just encourage you tonight that the pathway through is through rejection because he has something bigger in mind for you than the immediate and the short term. You see, what the reason for rejection is because there is something inside of us that is ingrained in us because of our fallen nature, that even despite our greatest efforts, despite what we tell other people, we would settle for something less than the greatest if it meant it could alleviate the discomfort and the pain of where we are. One of the primary motivators, there's two primary motivators that is on the inside of every single human being is hope for a future. Oh my gosh, isn't that car nice? That car could be yours. It's $150,000, which means that Robert Sr. is going to need about two more raises before he gets there. <laughs> you see that car? Isn't that nice? Oh, it smells even better on the inside. This thing drives itself, literally, which is great for me, Leilani will tell you. And here's the is that it can all be yours. Hope for a future. <clears throat> God will often motivate us by giving us a picture of something that is in our future that could be if we're willing to take the steps. But if that doesn't work, God has another lever that he likes to pull. Because humans can be driven by something called the burning platform principle, which means that your platform that you're standing on right now, which is comfortable, you know what? It's not a, it, I mean, it's a Toyota Camry. It may not be like a Tesla yet, but it's a Toyota Camry, it's kind of nice. Gets really good gas mileage, you know? Oh, the job I'm at, you know what? It's not as much as I should be getting, and I know that I've got all of these prophetic words about what I should be getting, that I should be starting businesses, but hey, it's providing for my family, so it's good here. And all of a sudden, is that fire? Did someone leave the stove on? That's weird. Huh. I had this altercation at my job. Boss that normally loves me is coming at me really, really hard all of a sudden. Mechanic told me that my tires are about running bare and my, my car is overheating. Weird. What is happening? I keep smelling that smoke. Hmm. 
must be the barbecue restaurant down the road. It makes me hungry. <gasps> My checking account is overdrawn. I can't buy lunch. What is happening? Could it be that God is actually burning your boats? That he's burning the very thing that you spent all of your time and your effort and your energy to build. Because when the platform underneath you is burning, you have no choice but to leap to the next thing that God has for you. But can I tell you that in the moment, in that particular moment, it makes you feel like God is very, very cruel. It can make you feel like God is not fair to you. And you can, might, you might look at it, you might say, God, I'm doing all of these things. I'm doing 90% of what you told me to do. Why are you making it this difficult? And why are you making it where it feels like the world is turning against me? Am I talking to anybody in here? Has anybody else experienced this in their life? You have, there are many of us in here where we have felt like we were not God's favorite person. I know we sing about it, but sometimes we feel like the opposite. And the reason why is because God loves you so much, he's not willing to let you settle for less. And if we could just hear, and I, here's the interesting thing, is that Moses, who was married to his own idea, to his own strengths, to his own ability to fulfill his word, God loves Moses as much as he loves and is set on delivering his people. But he has to use rejection in order to break Moses free from everything that would try to hold him in his season. That's why rejection. And the reason why, which is what I love about God, and this is why the prophetic is so important, is because the prophetic gives you a preview of what's to come so it doesn't take you by surprise. So instead of you standing there being, oh my gosh, why, why, why is this happening? You have a prophetic word on an audio somewhere from a cell phone from Prophet John that tells you, and the Lord would say that in six months your life is going to hell, right? Oh, I'm just joking. <laughs> But the prophetic gives you a preview of what's to come Amen. so that it doesn't take you by surprise. So that rather than fight against God, you partner with him in the circumcision that he's doing in your soul. And all of a sudden, the prophetic changes your ear from hearing an angry God to hearing a loving father that comes and says, come on, David. Come on. Come on, I know it's comfortable. I know it's good here, but I need to burn these things because you can't be a slave to these things any longer. Right. You see, Moses, before he can set anybody free, he's got to set himself free. Yes. And God uses rejection to do it. Now, here's the other reason why. Because here's the prophetic word that Moses got about this whole situation. And it's in Exodus chapter 9. Verse 12. Oh, wait, no, that's the wrong one. We just read that. Exodus 7, 3. God tells Moses, but I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in Egypt, he will not listen to you. What a prophetic word. Anybody want that prophetic word? Hey, despite your greatest efforts and how powerful I move you, they're still not going to listen to you, and they're still going to hate you. That's a great prophetic word. That's super edifying. <laughs> then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and with mighty acts of judgment, I will bring out my divisions. My people, the Israelites, and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring the Israelites out of it. So one of the reasons why God allows difficulty in our process of becoming a deliverer is because God needs to demonstrate his authority, his dominance, and his unquestionable power against the kingdoms of this earth. And here's the amazing thing, is that the fulfillment of your prophetic word is meant to be a demonstration of God's dominance on earth. There's a story in the Bible, and it's uh, well documented, the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant is this beautiful thing. It's, not, it's the thing that Indiana Jones saw. Uh, 
It's gold, it's beautiful, there's covering angels on the top of it. And one of the things about the Ark of the Covenant was that no human being was allowed to touch it. And the moment they touched it, the moment they made contact with it, they would be struck down and they would die. The Ark of the Covenant was the physical manifestation of God's presence, His glory, and His power. Before God can use you as His Ark of the Covenant on earth, He has to make sure that your hands are clean and that you as a vessel do not touch what was always meant for Him. I invite Pastor if he can come to the keys and we're going to pray this over you. Is that what God is doing in the midst of this process with the rejection, with the heaviness, it's not just rejection. Some of us have come against a tremendous amount of accusation in this season. Coming from people that should know better and should be carrying themselves better than they do. Some of us have experienced the closing of doors of opportunity. You see, our Moses-like deliverer process may not necessarily be rejection, but it is the very thing in us that drives us crazy. It is the very thing that is sourced and rooted that if we look at all of the mistakes that we've made in our life, those bad decisions, those bad choices, that was the motivator behind all of it. See, I can identify with Moses. I can identify with what he had to go through because one of the greatest battles I had to endure has been with rejection. I can remember growing up as a child and I'd always feel this hole on the inside of me. It felt almost like I didn't quite belong. Some of you may have felt that before, where no matter where you are, with whatever friends you are, no matter how popular you are, you feel like you don't quite belong, like you're not quite wanted. Turns out that for me, I actually came into this world a little bit sooner than my family would have expected or have wanted. And I made that exact sound probably. <laughs> I, you brought me out here. I didn't want to be here. <laughs> and I can remember growing up all throughout, growing up in New York, upstate New York, where the predominant uh, races in the area of the culture was Italian and Hispanic and, and largely Caucasian. And here I am, the lone Asian kid, right? The one kernel of corn in a sea of milk. Just chilling. I can remember always feeling that rejection amplified over and over and over again. I remember being in a situation, a season, where I, it's my first day of kindergarten. I, I get on the bus. I'm the only Asian kid in the whole place. And I'm in the worst possible position. I'm the last kid to get picked up. You never want to be the last kid picked up on the bus because your your seating seating like options are very limited. And I was sitting down to the one kid that was smiling and waving at me and bringing me and motioning me to come sit down. And I sit down and he keeps smiling. But then all of a sudden I feel pain in the back of my head. And I realize that this Caucasian kid is beating the back of my head with a seatbelt. And what I feel the pain and that liquid coming down the back of my neck is actually my own blood. And he won't stop, and I don't know how to make him stop until the bus driver pulls over and pulls him away from me. Can I tell you that when I go to school and my parents are talking to the principal, the response from the school is, well, it's just kids being kids. You see, rejection has always been one of my greatest battles. It has been, bless you, it has been one of my greatest issues. It has driven me to do things that I should not have done, but I did anyways because the enemy came, knew exactly how to push me, to get me to settle for a lesser form of who I am. And God wanted me to tell you that he doesn't want that to happen to you. He doesn't want you to settle simply because you're the victim of your circumstances and your culture and your upbringing. That's why it's been so difficult. That's why it's been so hard. It's not to frustrate you, to condemn you, or make you feel like you're a failure. It's God burning the bridges and the home that you built to protect yourself from the pain that the enemy tried to bring in your life. He's saying you don't have to live there anymore. He's looking at you like a burning bush telling Moses you don't have to be in this desert anymore. 
You don't have to let rejection define you anymore. You can come with me. Well, God could have done it by himself. God could have delivered this entire people group by himself, but he went to a desert to look for a man that had given up on himself because he thought he was a failure because God loved Moses. God loves you. That's why he has moved heaven and earth. That's why he shut the doors. That's why he's allowed people to act crazy in your life, not to reject you, but to set you free from the thing that has tormented you ever since you were a child. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I pray for every single one in here that has been driven and motivated and, and, and manipulated by the enemy, by the pain of their past, by the rejection of those around them, by family expectation and their failures. Father, now in the name of Jesus, I say that this moment, right now, they're free. Father, this moment, right now, what they thought was rejection in their process, you're changing their vision to realize that it's destiny that's calling them. It's their future that's calling. It's the, it's the fulfillment of the greatness of who they are that's calling. It's not their failure. It's not that thing in the back of their mind that says, oh yeah, everything's good now, but here's the thing is that I'm not good enough, really. The other shoe's about to drop any minute now, and they're going to see me for the failure that I am. I'm going to tell you right now that that is a false prophetic word that has been spoken against you. I don't care who it came from. It could have been a preacher. It could have been a teacher that tried to make you feel like you were broken. And I am telling you right now that nothing could be further from the truth. You are called. You're not broken. Yeah, you may have been benched for a while. Yeah, you may have been exiled for a while. Yeah, you had to come to the end of your pride in a lot of different areas. But I'm telling you right now that you were never meant to sit on the backside of the desert looking after sheep. You are meant to rise up as a deliverer. You're meant to be that person that stands in the midst of adversity. And even the people you're trying to help are trying to reject you, trying to say, who do you think you are? But because you have allowed God to use rejection to mold you and craft you and make you into one that is free. That is not bound by those expectations anymore. You can stand in the face of any rejection, even from the people that you're meant to help. And you can say, it's okay. It's all right. It's all right. You can try. You can do everything you want to do. You can kick. You can scream. You can call me a loser. You can call me, say that I, I've let you out in the desert to die. It's okay. It's okay. It's fine. It's all right. You know why? Because I'm free. I'm free. Father, I thank you right now. Tonight, Lord, we're free. Father, tonight, right now, the process, even though it's felt intense, even though it's been difficult and it's hard, we're free because you're making us that way, because you're setting us everything crooked on the inside of us. You're setting us right. Just I want to invite you right now to stand up right where you are because I need to pray this over you. We need to break off all of this stuff, all of this junk that has been there because you're free. Some of us in here, we need to define ourselves differently. We've been talking about ourselves in a way that is not correct. And we have to begin to define ourselves by what God is doing in us rather than how we have lived our lives before. Father, now in the name of Jesus, I just want to invite you to stand with your hands up high. Father, we break off every single thing that has tried to define us. We break off every single thing that has tried to bind us to our past, to bind us to our failures. And Father, I thank you right now that we shake off that heaviness. We shake off that pain. Some of you guys got to shake your hands. You got to shake your shoulders. You got to move around a little bit. Some of you are so stiff because the enemy's trapped you into a corner. But no one puts baby in the corner. Come on. <laughs> Father, now in the name of Jesus, we say that where the enemy has backed us into a corner to make us a failure, you have backed us into a corner to show us a future bigger than we could have imagined. Now, right now, I see some of us in here 
even though we don't feel like it, even though we don't feel qualified, there is something inside of this message that says that I'm calling you to be a deliverer because that's what God is. And even though in the natural it doesn't look like it, by the Spirit, you know that it's true for you. You know that God has called you to demonstrate this, but you don't know how. But you know that you need to answer that call. Because if you stay where you are any longer, if you remain in your season any longer, you know it's going to consume you. You know that your future is done if you stay there. If that's you and you're saying, God, I will pay the price and I'm willing to become that deliverer. I want you to raise your hands up really, really high. Right where you are, Father, now in the name of Jesus, we make a commitment. Lord God, right now, we thank you that you burned the platform underneath us. But Father, now we take a leap in the spirit. We take a jump right beyond where we've been. And we're grabbing hold of that thing, even though we don't understand it, even though we don't know what it is, even though we don't have a picture, we don't have the resources, we don't have the finances, our family says that we can't do it. But Father, now in the name of Jesus, we grab that future in the name of Jesus. Just do me a favor. Take a deep breath in. Deep breath out. Some of us, that's been one of the biggest breaths we've taken in a long time. Because we've felt so much pressure on us. We've felt, felt so much weight on us. And God says, now we're done. We're finished with that. It's over. It's done. We're stepping into a new level of freedom. We're yes. stepping into a new place of breakthrough. My friend right here with the awesome bandana, tell me your name. Kayloka. Kayloka? Kayloka, the moment you walked in, I just saw the presence of God resting all over you. Because you know what it is to have had to overcome impossible odds to be where you are. In fact, right now, even just from a few weeks ago, it's a miracle that you're here right now. Because there were things that were set against you where you shouldn't even be here. And the Lord wanted me to tell you that that wasn't by accident. But just like Moses, God says that he moved heaven and earth to come into your life to intervene because there's a call on your life that's bigger than you realize. I just see from the age of five and six, it was a very tumultuous time for you. It's a really difficult time because you know, kind of like what I was talking about, where you felt like a stranger in your own home, in your own family. And in fact, there was so much rejection that came in in that season that you always felt like you had to apologize for even being around. God wanted me to tell you right now that you are not an accident to him. You are not a mistake to him. And even those things that the people had said in your
God's not done with some of us in here right now. Some of us, we've had to harden our heart because we needed to survive. And God says, it's time to let go. It's time to let me come in with my oil. Soften the areas of your heart that you have to protect on your own. And God says, it's okay, I'm here now. I'm here now. Father, in the name of Jesus, come in with your oil. Come in with your anointing. You'll work for the investment of time. Don't feel like you need a rush for this. God's doing it for you. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, soften our hearts, Lord, in the areas that have been wounded and been in pain. Thank you, Lord. Father, you're not a bully, you're a friend. You're not a tormentor. You're our champion. And Father, I thank you right now that you fight for us and our future more than we even fight for our future. So Father, we receive it. Just right now as we close, I just want you to look up to heaven and just smile and allow gratitude to fill you for the fact that God brought you into this place. God's brought you into this moment because he loves you. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. We repent for every area where we were ungrateful. Father, we repent for every area where we weren't thankful because we didn't understand. We couldn't see past our pain. But Father, we see it now. God, we see it now. You're doing this because you love us. And there's a treasure in us that you laid in the way that you cannot wait to show us. to do whatever it takes to reveal our treasures that's on the inside of us. In the name of Jesus, if you believe it, say amen. Amen and amen. Man, how many of you love a good... There's like, there's an anointing in the sanctuary. I want to encourage you. It's not just for the service. It's an ongoing thing that God wants to do. And that when you here tonight, He wants to talk to you about it. He wants to have conversations with you about it. But our team is here. Veronica, Robert Sr., Robert Jr. with his ethnic masculinity is here for you. We're here to walk this out with you. You don't have to do it alone. So I invite you to have a conversation with us, talk with us. And let's get a plan together to be able to pursue that deliverance mantle that's in you. Amen. Well, why don't you give someone a hug? Thank you so much for coming out here. Check out our Discover track.